I was watching uh, I was watching a church service recently, my wife and I. And it was one of our larger churches, Sister Myrie. One of our larger churches. A lot of kids. And I appreciate the children's story this morning. But there were a lot of kids. And it was obvious that the person telling the children, so I, I, I want you to listen. I want you to listen to what I'm going to say. You could miss the sermon, but don't miss this. The person who was ch telling the children's lesson, it's what I think it should be, just not a story. Because some of the stories are real Nancy stories. But the person who was telling the story was obviously educated. She used a lot of big words, adult language. But she told the story. It was a long story. She lost the kids after the first two minutes. They were lost. They were playing. And then at the end of the story, she said, there are two most important things in your life. And she's telling children this. What are the most two important things in your life that you need to look forward to? A lot of the children, you ask a child that, wants to buy a car, wants to go to college, wants to go out for ice cream after the service. Children. And after a little while. Old is at the time. Yeah. Why? Huh? Okay. That's that's what he was doing while he was singing. So maybe I'll sing like him after. So the children answered the way children should answer. Finally she said, No, all of you kids are wrong. And then she said, Here are the two most important things in your life that you need to look forward to. Number one. That's what she said. Number one, the most important thing in your life, my life, she said, for children, is to keep all of God's Ten Commandments. And I said to my wife, that is wrong. It's wrong. You don't teach children that. Then she said, I got a little excited. Then she said, the second most important thing in your life is to be saved when Jesus comes. I said, that is wrong also. Both of them are wrong. And I'm telling you today, those are wrong things to teach children. So my wife got excited. And she said to me, Steve, so what is the most important thing in, in, in our lives? I said to her, Marilyn, the most important thing in my life and your life is to be like Jesus. Cogitate what I just said. Think about it. The reason is because if I am like Jesus, I'm going to keep all the commandments. I'll not only keep 10, I'll keep 11. <laughs> Number one. And then if I am like Jesus, when Jesus comes, he will save me. There's no other reason for him to do anything but to save me. Why? Because I'm just like him. We don't teach children that. The most important thing in your life and my life is to be like Jesus. We have been for too long concentrating about doing and not being. Doing this and doing that and doing the other. Doing, doing, doing. Because we think that if we do, we will be saved. Righteousness is not attained by being righteous. Righteousness is attained by being like Jesus. You want to be righteous? Don't do things. Just be. Be like Jesus. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're saying what you're saying. We have been talking about doing too long. Let me go a little further. We tell our, we tell our young people, our young children who, you know, they have their moments... They wear jewelry and all that. And, and we tell them, take it off. But we do not remember to tell them what to put on instead. Take off this. Take off that. Take off the other. Yes, that's true. But what do they put in its place? Tell them to put the love of Jesus in their hearts. That's what they need to put. I, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to, yeah. We could sing the closing song and go home now. Because 
For too long, my brothers and sisters, too long in this church, and I've been preaching this gospel for 40 years, too long we talk about doing. Everything is doing this and doing that and doing the other, and we forgot how to be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. You know, I'm at the age now when I can say some things not because I want to talk but because of what I've seen so brothers and sisters let's let's try to be let's try to be more like Jesus because when we are like Jesus a lot of things fall into place and you know the truth is the truth is these young people these young people they see through us they see right through us all that stuff that we want them to do. We, they see through us. It's all right. If 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 you are blessed by what I said, say amen. amen. Blessed by what I said, say amen. I have entitled the message today "A Pot of Oil." A pot of oil. Um. Stand with me with your Bibles in hand. Turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. Let's see if we could be out of here in a half an hour's time. Still saying amen? <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 4. I read the first seven verses our, pre our preaching passage in your hearing. Second Kings chapter 4. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elijah saying, Thy servant my husband is dead and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord and the creditors and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? And he said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all the vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, Mommy, there is not a vessel more, and the oil stayed. Then she came and told the prophet, the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Let us pray. Father, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It was probably, it will probably never show up in the New York Times, nor will it be ripped from the headlines and reenacted on television. But a routine robbery is being carried out in, with precision across the United States and every other country in the world, every payday. It's a white collar crime, it's slippery and it's rampant. Police departments refuse to get involved and although they would probably classify it as grand larceny, unlawful taking of someone else's property, no one has ever been booked. Forcing the law would require all of each precinct's resources and even the police officers will have to uh, be locked up. If, if the police were arresting people for this crime, would you be arrested? Here is the text. 
Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinance and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But he said, Wherein have shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed thee in tithe and offering? You are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. The Bible has a rich resource of situations for just about every aspect of life. It seems like no situation in life is left out. Each of us can identify with a Bible character or a particular Bible passage. The rich and the famous have their kings, their governors, and the wealthy to identify with. There is Solomon, there is David, there is Abraham, there is Joseph. The poor and the needy have their widows, their, orph their, their orphans, and their roots. The good is present in the Bible. The bad is present in the Bible. The ugly is present. There are Jezebels and there are Naboths. Then there is an insignificant blind man that is listed. Jesus stops to touch a deaf man's ear. A nameless crippled child encounters Jesus. A mother whose son died and she is mourning his loss. Jesus raises him from the dead and puts a smile on the mother's face. A single father with a sick son begins to praise God. There is sibling rivalry in a rich home with two brothers. Hungry people are fed. Scared disciples run for cover when it's crunch time. There's racial confrontation, problems in the early church, the mother of James and John, she's jockeying for positions in the cabinet of Jesus, and so she says, put one on your right hand and one on your left hand. There are weddings, there are funerals, there are baptisms, there are baby dedications, board meetings in Jerusalem, church discipline, nothing and no one is left out from the Bible. And in our preaching passage today, we have a real life situation. A woman whose husband is dead and sp spent a lot of time working for the church. Not only is he dead, but he is poor like most of us. And he dies and he leaves a huge debt for his wife. In the passage, it is clear that the wife emphasizes the fact that her husband was a God-fearing man. But I want to remind you this afternoon that many God-fearing people are in a lot of debt today. Because you serve God does not mean that you're not going to be in debt. The Bible doesn't say how, how, how he got into debt. He may have lost his real estate. Others may have failed to make their commitments to him. He may have loaned church members money. And they did not repay him. He may have co-signed for a brother or sister whose credit was poor. And the brother or sister fell back on their payments. Whatever the cause. The man is dead and his debt is staring his wife in the face. A little bit of history. In Bible times, as it still is in some primitive communities... People borrow upon their personal credit and the primary security for debt is usually the children. So the more children you had, the more collateral you would have. I often wonder if that's the reason why David said that children are a blessing. <laughs> Therefore, if you could not pay your debt, the debtor and the family went into servitude. So this man dies and his poor wife is not only mourning his loss, but she has sleepless nights trying to figure out a payment plan. He dies. He's in debt. She has to take care of the funeral, but she has this large debt that she must take care of. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it's sad when the head of a household dies. But it's even sadder when the head of the household dies and there is no will, no money for the funeral service, and no provision for grieving. 
But the saddest is that there is a death and then there is a humongous debt hanging over the family. How sad it is when, when someone dies, there is no money to bury them. And then there is a debt that he leaves or she leaves that the family must pay. In a society in which we live today, men and women, we must make provision for our families. Can the church say amen? amen? Making a will does not hasten your death. Matter of fact, Matter of fact, it may cause you to live longer because the stress is off your mind. You've got to save something and at least have enough money to bury yourself. Don't leave all that debt for your family. Not even enough money to bury you. That's unfair to your family. Got to save something. At least have enough for your funeral services. Some, some of us, we just we spend everything we have. Everything we see others have, we want to possess it also. And so we spend everything we have and there is nothing left, no provision for even your funeral service. Got to have something dignified. A reflection of your taste. Every now and then someone dies and there's no money for, in the home. There is no money. Janice and I had to deal with that a few times. No, no money to bury. And we have to go and beg the funeral director. Beg the funeral home to have a pauper's funeral. <coughs> pauper's funeral. You get a coffin for $200. Oh, Talk to someone about life insurance. Can the church say amen? Amen. Yeah. You must have a vision for your family so that God can help you to make provision. Such was the plight of this widow. And before her husband's body could be cold, could get cold, the creditors, they've come to the door and they're looking for payment. What a prediction. Your husband just died. You are stressed out thinking about how to bury him. You are grieving. You are penniless. You have his outstanding debt to pay. And then there are two strangers standing at your door with one question. I, we need your two boys. The repossessors are there. The truck is parked in the driveway and the neighbors have all come out and they're watching. The car is impounded and four men are carrying all the furniture and all the appliances into the PC Richards truck. But then there is the widow. She's standing, she's weeping, and she's wailing. She's helpless. My brothers and sisters, you have a family? If the Lord delays his coming and you die, make sure that there is some preparation for your burial and some preparation for your family to continue living. It's a weak amen, but it's all right. You'll never be able to say this wasn't preached on this pulpit. Does your spouse or a significant other know anything about your finances? If not, the government will take it. Your bank account, your insurance, besides your name, whose name is on your important documents? So here she was, weeping and wailing alone, but she was not lonely. And I've got to rush this through if I'm going to finish by one thing. When, when, when the pressures of life, when the pressure of life is messing with you, when it seems like all hope is gone, when mother and father and brother and sister turn their back on you. When there are more bills than Washingtons. Some of y'all going to get it on the bus. When the boss is giving you a rough time. When, when the children have left the Lord. When the doctor says that the news isn't good. When the growth and the spot is getting bigger and bigger. When you had a little talk with Jesus but that did not make it all right. I want you to remember, don't give up. 
Keep the faith. Your blessing is on its way. Can you say amen? amen. And in times like those, in times like those, you may be going through. But don't tell everybody. Just one. Tell a God-fearing person that you can trust. The reason why some of us, our business is on the street is because we tell everybody. And everybody got somebody they need to tell. And before you know it, you're walking in church thinking that you're coming to worship Jesus, but folk are looking and laughing at you. Don't tell two or three. One, someone who will not share your business with anyone else. Someone who will cry with you. Can the church say amen? Someone who will say, I'm here for you. Someone who will give you a hug. Someone who will immediately reach in their wallets or reach in their pocketbooks and put something in your empty hand. So the Bible says, when this certain woman was confronted with her misfortune, she was led to God by God to Elisha, who not only listened, but made an effort to do something. He just didn't say, I'll pray for you, the prophet. He just didn't say, I'll pray for you. He may even have reminded her to trust God, but in addition, he added some works to her faith. By the way, let me say something here for you to remember. Widows and orphans were given special attention in the Jewish economy, the Jewish community. Those who took advantage or neglected widows and orphans were considered extremely offensive, just as it is today. A Jew need not go outside their community to be cared for. Listen to this. A Jew is born in a Jewish hospital, educated in a Jewish school, raised in a Jewish community, eats only Jewish food, worships in a Jewish synagogue, reared in a Jewish home, convalesces at a Jewish retirement home, dies at a Jewish nursing home, buried in a Jewish cemetery, from the cradle to the grave, Jewish. Let me share something else with you. According to the author, Brooke Stevens' book, Taking Dollars and Making Sense, a wealth building guide for African Americans. Listen to this. Whatever you're doing, stop doing it now. Listen to this. The lifespan of a dollar in the Asian community is 28 days. In a Jewish community, the lifespan of a dollar is 19 days. And shockingly, the lifespan in the African American community is approximately six hours. moment we get paid, our dollars leave our community. Verse 2 is pregnant with lessons for us today. I just want to say some other things, but I tell you, time is against me. Verse 2 is pregnant with lessons for us today. The Bible says, And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for you? She, she comes to Elisha. Her husband is dead. There is a debt. She has two sons who may go into servitude. She's crying. She's helpless. She needs help. And she comes to Elisha and tells Elisha what her problem is. And Elisha says to her, what can I do for you? Tell me, what hast thou in thine house? And she said, thine handmaid had nothing, had not anything in the house save a pot of oil. What can I do for you? All those words were comforting to her. After pouring out her heart and soul to someone who looks at you and, and then they will say to you after you have poured out your heart, poured out your soul, they look at you and say to you, I really can't help you brother, I really can't help you sister, or, or, or you got a real problem. 
Then if someone else may say to you, only God can handle this problem. But to hear someone say, how can I help you? What can I do for you? That's like a cool glass of water on a parched and thirsty throat. Pot of oil. Most homes in Israel still have a little olive oil somewhere in the house. There are two things you cannot get away from when you go into a Jewish home. There is always pita bread. Because you know, sees you shaking your head. There's always pita bread and virgin olive oil. Always. Two things. Uh, most homes, it, it, it's sometimes called an anointing. The oil is either used to take the bread and, and dip the bread in, in oil and eat the bread. Or the oil is used if you are sick and not feeling well, the body is tired, you need a massage, you need a relaxing, take some olive oil and massage the body with it. Just enough to anoint the body or to do a little cooking. So her answer was a small part of oil. Elisha understood this. This is Jewish tradition, to have some olive oil in the house. And so she said, I've got a small part. Small, understand small when we get to the end of the story. It's a small pot, not a large pot. She has a small pot of oil. That's all I've got. Elisha asked her, what do you have? Give me something to work with. What has God given you? And what are you bringing to the table? Notice, 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 my brothers and sisters. That God always takes us where we are and uses what we have to perform a miracle. You gotta come to God. God always gives you something. This is, Lord, all I have is a little water in a bottle. And God will take this little water and he will perform a miracle for me. He always gives us something to come to the table with. Moses, what do you have? I got a rod. Take that very rod and I'll part the Red Sea. Aaron, what do you have? I have an old stick. Cast it before Pharaoh and it shall become a serpent. What do you have, little boy? Lord, all I have are five biscuits and two sardines. Give it to me and I'll open up the largest country buffet you ever saw. What do you have, David? Lord, I have a bag with a sling. And five smooth stones. What do you have, Joshua? I've got some torches and some trumpets. Light those torches and blow those trumpets and watch as the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. What do you have, Peter? Lord, I've got me an old net that needs repair. Cast that old net that needs repair on the other side and I will fill it up with so much fish that your boat will begin to sink. What do you have, Samson? Lord, I just have a little strength and a little hair. I got two blind eyes. Stand before these two pillars and you will destroy more people when you are dying than in your lifetime. What do you have in your purse, my sister? What do you have in your wallet, my brother? Give, God says, give me one tenth and add a faithful offering with it and watch your pot of oil overflow. What do you have, lady? Lord, I have a small pot of oil. Yes, God has given to each one of us something that he can work with. Amen. Don't you ever say that God has not given you something that he can work with. Every one of us, God has gifted us. God has birthed within us something that when he's ready for you, he'll call you to give it back to him so he can work for you. And the more you are faithful with the little that you have, the quicker God can trust you with more. Amen. And the reverse is also true. The less you are faithful, the quicker you're going to lose it. I'm going to say that one again. The less you are faithful, the quicker you will lose it. Could it be? Could it be why some of us never get very much? Maybe it's because God cannot trust us with much. Elisha seems to be 
helping, but it also seems like he's complicating her life even more. Remember, her husband dies. She's mourning his loss. She has no money to bury him. And then she has a debt that she needs to pay. The creditors are standing there waiting to take her two boys out. She's going to be alone. She's going to be lonely. And now Elisha complicates her life even more. And Elisha says to her, verse 3, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. Go throughout the neighborhood, borrow empty vessels. She's already having problems because her husband may have borrowed. But Elisha now complicates her life and says to her, and, and the passage, the text is, is laden. Watch the language. Go borrow the vessels abroad. Just don't borrow from the neighbors around, but go into the other villages and borrow. Borrow abroad of all thy neighbors. Even empty vessels. And then, then he adds, borrow not a few. Borrow a whole lot of stuff. She was already in a predicament to pay her husband's creditors. Now Elisha sends her to borrow again. She could have said, no, I can't borrow anything again. But she trusted God and this God-fearing man. Can the church say amen? amen. Borrow empty vessels, suggesting that there be something to put in them. She, she didn't say, he didn't say borrow full vessels, borrow empty vessels. Suggesting there will be something to put in them. Borrow from all your neighbors. Borrow all that you can. She and her two sons. Some of her neighbors loaned her while some laughed at her. She borrowed cups, she borrowed glasses, she borrowed pots, she borrowed pens, she borrowed goblets. Anything that could hold something, she borrowed. She borrowed with the faith that God was going to put something in those vessels. I'm hastening now. Verse 4. And when here, here is what Elisha says. Go and borrow, borrow, borrow from everybody and come back home. And then when thou art come in, verse 4, thou shalt shut the door, close the door behind you and upon thy sons and shall pour out into those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So, when you come back from borrowing, you and your two sons shut the door behind you, go inside, and remember it was just a small pot of oil. Pour out oil and set them aside. When every, so this one is full, put it down. This one is full, put it down. Just keep putting them down, as I have said to you. So she went from him, shut the door. Obviously the boys went and they got the vessels. Shut the door upon her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. Verse 6. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, all of them, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her sons, and one of the sons, she said to him, Yeah, bring mama one more vessel. And he said unto her, There is no more. All the vessels we brought, they are all full. And he said unto her, there is no more vessels. And the Bible says, watch this. And the oil stopped flowing. Remember, there was a little pot that filled all those vessels. And the moment, the moment she said, bring me one more vessel. And the son said, mommy, there are no more vessels. The Bible says that the oil stopped flowing. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, I have filled all the vessels. The oil stopped flowing. And Elisha said to her, Go, this is probably the sweetest part of the sermon. Go, sell the oil, and pay your debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. The Hebrew says, for the rest of your life. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, when God takes the natural, 
and he's going to make it supernatural, he sometimes wants it to be done in private. My brothers and sisters, there is no limit to God's power when we are faithful to him. Can the church say amen? amen. But your blessings, your blessings, your blessings may be limited by your capacity to receive those blessings. If she had more vessels, she would have had more oil. She could have filled more, but she did not have any more. So I say to you today, you got a dollar? God says, put a dime and give me something else. Maybe a nickel or maybe another dime. Put it in an envelope. You have a hundred dollars? Ten dollars belong to me. Put that in the envelope and give me a gift. Because sometimes when we talk about robbing God, we sometimes forget that we don't only rob God with our tithe, but the Bible says we rob him with our tithe and our offerings. I bless your eighty-five dollars because when you when when you, when I give you a hundred dollars and you take ten and you give back to me, which is my tithe, and you take another five and you put it for the offering for the church budget, so you give me fifteen. God says that the eighty-five that you have remaining, the eighty-five blessed by God means more will go further than a hundred unblessed by God. You don't believe it. Eighty-five dollars with God's blessings will go further than a hundred dollars that is unblessed. Some folk are looking at me like if my math is off. It is off. It is off. But God's way of multiplying is, is by subtracting. God says, give, and I'm going to give you more. Subtract from you, I'm going to give you more. The problem in the church is not money. The problem in the church is that we are not all surrendered to Jesus. The problem in the church is that many of us have not given all to Jesus. Because when we give all to Jesus, our wallets and our pocketbooks will follow. Can the church say amen? I'm going to quit now. While she was filling a vessel, she said to her son, bring mommy another vessel. And the boy had to confess that there were no more vessels. The Bible states that the moment he said there is not another vessel, the oil stayed. The oil stopped. God wouldn't have us his blessings wasted. All to Jesus, I swear. God wouldn't have his blessings just fall to the ground. When you trust God, he will always find a way. Can the church say amen? amen? David says, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Amen. Hey, your responsibility is to obey God. Can you say amen? amen. God's responsibility is to take care of you. Amen. Don't try to take care of yourself. That's God's job. Your job is to obey him. He says, give me ten and five. That's what he's asking for. You have 85 remain. He's going to bless the 85. That it would mean, mean more than the 100 you had before. You have a covenant with God. Your responsibility is to give to God what already belongs to him. When I get a hundred dollars, a hundred of those, when I get a hundred dollars, ten of those dollars, they are not mine. Absolutely not. The tithe is uncontested and non-negotiable. God has even specified the amount he wants. You know, may I suggest to you that if God had said, give, a, give him 10% tithe and 40% offering, you know we would have been faithful? Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he specified. But when God is not specific with us, we cheat him. And we are not we are not generous with him. If God had said 10 10 percent tithe and 40 percent offering, 50 percent of our salaries, we'd have been faithful. Why? Because he's specified. But when God leaves it up to us to be generous with him, we become stingy with him. Something to cogitate upon. Your responsibility is to obey God, and his responsibility is to make sure that all your needs are met. I want to remind you that God is faithful. 
when we obey God, He will keep our pots of oil flowing. Can the church say amen? amen. When we obey God, He will provide money for the rent. Yes. When we obey God, He will provide enough for us to pay the mortgage. When we obey God, He will put clothes on our backs. Can the church say amen? When we obey God, He will put adequate food on the table. When we obey God, He will keep us healthy. When we obey God, He will make sure that our shoes last longer than those who are unfaithful. When we obey God, the roofs on our homes and our cars will not need as much repair as others because God will favor us. But when you obey God, your pot of oil will never run dry. My mother, who I saw recently, is 92 years old. My wife, my two kids went to see her because she's been complaining lately that at, 80, at 92 she just wants to lie down one of these nights and just sleep on until Jesus comes. And every time she says it, the children get nervous. Brothers and sisters get nervous. But my mother has been up faithful prayer warrior. My father was a very religious man, but my mother was very spiritual. My father was the head of the church for maybe 40 years. My mother prayed for 40 years. So when we were small, there were eight children. I think my last sister wasn't born yet. My mother was always praying. One day, there was a family up on the hill, not far from us. He was one of the elders of the church, and there was a message sent to my mother that they did not have any food in their home. They had nine children. And so my mother, when she heard that, she went and she got two boxes and all the food. Remember, my mother has seven children. She collected all the food in the cupboards, the boxes and told myself and my little brother to take the food up to brother Mark's home. As children, we watched our mother, we thought that she was going a little crazy, taking all the food to give to somebody else. So one of the children said to mommy, mommy, what, what's going to happen to us? And all my mother said is, the Lord will provide. Nothing more. And with, with the eyes that a mother gives to a child when you are not behaving or you are not believing, she looked at him and said, that's it, no more discussion. We took the food up to the family. And I remember the mother saying, thank you. It was me and my younger brother, Jude. Went home, my mother called all seven children and my father, and she said, let's pray. When my mother called the children to pray, this was not one person praying, everybody prayed. We had morning worship, evening worship, everybody prayed. And I was so glad that I was one of the youngest ones. We started from the youngest to the oldest, so that once the little ones finished, you, you found a sleeping posture so that you could lie down and rest because it's going to be long. So we prayed. And we specifically pray that God will provide something for us today. You gotta make your prayer specific to God. Lord, we need some food today, not tomorrow, today. We got it from our knees. And we heard a knock on the door. Mrs. Cassidy, the voice said, can you open the door, please? When my mother prayed, when we were praying, she would close the door. Everything stopped when my mother said, it's time to pray. She closed the door. We heard the knock. Mrs. Cassidy, I opened the door. And there was a young man standing at the door. He said, Mrs. Cassidy, my father and I both went to the store today my mother made me a list, but because my father knew what we wanted, we both bought the same set of stuff. And I have four bags in my hand that my mother said, maybe the Cassidy's need some food. And so she sent me here to bring it to you. And my mother, I stand here today, said to us, 
the exact food that she gave to the family, God returned it to us. You can't be God's giving. No matter how you try, the more you give to God, the more God will give to you. And if for some reason you forgot to give God, or you thought you forgot, give it back to Him. I have watched God would. They married and I would show whether we gave to a certain project. So we gave it a second time. And before the day was done, we got it back two times. For you must understand that's how God works. I'm not telling you stuff that I don't know about. I'm not telling you stories that I've read. I'm telling you how God works in my life and that he can work in your life too. Stand with me as we sing all to Jesus.